BC forests, our prime natural resource, are being attacked by insects, by fungi, by other pests. To put this attack in perspective, we harvest 70 million cubic meters of wood a year. 70 million. But we lose 40 million a year to pests. This is war, and the BC Ministry of Forests and Lands is fighting back. The stakes are high. Thousands of trees, thousands of jobs, the future livelihood of many. This is a costly war. We fight it with research, with technology, with surveillance. But we are committed to fighting it. This is the story of how that war is being carried on. Pests, they're eating away at BC forests. They do three times the damage that forest fires do. Insects like the mountain pine beetle are among the most serious threats to BC trees. The beetles have expensive tastes. They prefer mature trees. And a single infestation like this one in the Chilcotin can cover hundreds of square miles. Last year, eight and a quarter million dollars were spent combating the mountain pine beetle. But insects are not the only pests attacking the forest. Dwarf mistletoe is a parasite plant that reduces the growth of BC's hemlock and lodgepole pine by five million cubic meters of wood a year. Fungi, especially those that cause root rot, eat away at our trees and eventually kill them. Some fungi can live in the ground for decades on old roots. Bark-loving animals like deer, mice, voles, squirrels, and porcupines can be a threat to young trees. And fast-growing plants like alder can stifle the seedlings of a new softwood forest. These and other pests threaten tomorrow's harvestable forests. Sometimes they threaten the food supply of BC's wildlife or the crown rangeland needed by BC ranchers. The BC Ministry of Forests and Lands works to reduce the effects of pests in a cycle of detection, damage appraisal, and treatment. Pests reduce what we can harvest from the forest. So pest management has become an important part of forest management planning. Okay, what we've done here is uh, trying to uh, control the browsing on the uh, young fur seedlings here from elk and deer. And these uh, particular devices are a plastic uh, Vexar tubing. The trees are, are able to grow in these, in these casings and grow freely. And uh, eventually this uh, particular casing will break down with uh, sunlight and allow the stem to grow uh, unimpeded. If a species of tree is vulnerable to insects, pest management specialists may recommend an early harvest before the insects get started or the harvesting plan may include the removal of infected stumps along with logs, one of the few effective treatments for root rot. Okay, this is a sample of uh, Philinus wearii, which is a root rot. It's called a laminated root rot because of the, the way the, the wood actually separates itself. Uh, I'm standing here in a commercial thinning stand, and it's, it's uh, a major problem in stands like this where we've uh, thinned out the trees, the remaining trees are susceptible to wind throw, and this root rot uh, will decay the roots, therefore the, the trees uh, won't have any support. It's also a, a fungus that is, uh, uh, moves along the root from one tree to the next. So once you've got it in a stand, it, it's something you pretty well have to do something about. You can't just ignore it. The, the silviculture treatment for root rots, like, uh, like Philinus, uh, consists of pulling the stumps, which, which in fact remove the infectious material from the soil. Um, that's a very expensive treatment. You're looking at uh, thousand dollars a hectare. Another alternative is to plant a species that is less susceptible to to the root rot. Um, cedar is, is resistant but we don't always want to plant cedar so we'll plant a, a species such as white pine which is less susceptible, certainly not totally resistant, but less susceptible to the root rot itself. This screw behind me here is uh, clipping off the lower branches of the pine to uh, prevent the blister rust from entering the tree and killing it. Um, it's a major problem in this area, and all white pine are affected. The blister rust spores are carried to the needles, as shown on this lower branch here. Uh, they get into the stem and form a canker. This canker spreads along to the butt of the uh, pine tree and kills the tree by removing the branches 
that removes the infection sites. In some areas, fast-growing plants like alder may compete with seedlings. The plan may include planting jumbo seedlings at the earliest possible time to give the new forest a head start. How can we detect pests at work? In the case of insects, an annual Canada-wide federal survey shows any major trends in damage. Some widespread problems can be seen from the air and in satellite images but they must be confirmed by close-up surveys on the ground. When field staff detect a pest problem, the ministry moves into the second phase, appraising the damage. What is at risk? Timber? Wildlife habitat? A watershed? Property values? Human health? Regional specialists appraise the damage. With this information in hand, protection staff members can take the third step, develop a strategy to treat the problem. The district pest management specialist will study all the options available for dealing with the problem. What would they cost in dollars, in environmental effects, and in social effects? Sometimes the best option is to do nothing. But if the decision is to suppress the outbreak, the ministry can use a variety of techniques. One is to harvest infested trees. Another is the use of biologicals, including viruses that attack specific insects or bacteria. Artificial scents called pheromones are used to attract insects to a trap. This is a pheromone trap for mountain pine beetle. It's on the tree to attract beetles to this particular tree. Um, we'll come back at a later date and dispose of this tree, which will eliminate any of the population that has gathered in the tree itself. Sometimes teams are sent to fight small beetle outbreaks. If the outbreak is hard to reach, but important, a ramp attack team may be dropped by helicopter. Trees may be cut and burned. Treatments vary greatly with the problem. In the Prince Rupert region, porcupines are causing substantial damage to several commercial tree species. Biologists are releasing a number of fishers, animals of the weasel family, to control the porcupine population. Chemicals are seldom used for pest suppression. But if the use of pesticides is considered, the process is strictly controlled by a system of applications and hearings into the need and the solution community concerns may be aired. For greatest control and safety, almost all pesticide spraying is done at ground level. The fourth step in the pest management process is to learn from experience. Maps of pest outbreaks are stored in computer format. A record is kept of each control measure and the effects it produced. Information from the inventory branch helps silviculture and pest management staff decide what steps to take. Research and development underlie every phase of pest management. Programs carried out by the Ministry, BC Universities, the Canadian Forestry Service, and the U.S. Forest Service have resulted in new techniques that are now in use in BC. The Ministry's pest management program extends to BC's valuable Crown rangeland as well. Here the concern is to protect the range from invaders like knapweed, a quick-spreading Asian plant that covers valuable grazing land. In this strategic, high-stakes battle with pests, the Ministry of Forests and Lands is committed to the safe, effective protection and enhancement of the forest and range resource.